last week on what the Bible says uh, to the wife as it comes to thriving and not just surviving. Uh, and so 1 Peter chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. Last week, we looked at one point. That point was be faithful, talking about submission. Uh, and Sister Tammy told me after I gave her the notes for that first message, she said, Dear heaven, if it's going to be one message per, uh, or one point per message, we're going to be here a while. Uh, but I can tell you, the rest of it's tonight. <laughs> so, so, out of those seven points, or six or seven points that we started with a couple weeks ago. First Peter chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are, are not afraid with any amazement. Father, we come to you thanking you for the reading of your word tonight. I ask that you just hide me behind Calvary as I try to share what you've burdened my heart with. May it help us as a church, Father, be able to truly thrive and not just survive as Satan turns up the heat in our society and upon Christians. I pray that it'll give us the strength that we need, the knowledge that we need to live in a way that will bring honor and glory to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Now, in the last message where we talked about the first part of the verse, talking about the wives being in subjection to your own husbands, and we saw that there, that little phrase really has a lot packed into it. First of all, the idea of subjection carries the idea not of inferiority in any way, but of the idea of willingly lining up under authority. We saw that submission plays out when the wife, first of all, doesn't live outside of the direction of her husband, and then secondly, doesn't live in rebellion against the direction of her husband. We also saw that while the wife should follow the lead of her husband, at the same time, there is in the properly functioning Christian home the availability of a feedback mechanism for the wife to communicate back to her husband about areas of concern. We talked about the hand reaching for the doorknob and it being hot, being able to tell the head, stop reaching for the doorknob. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing. And it's in the interest of the husband, just like it's in the interest of the body, uh, of the head of the body, to pay attention to those warnings. We also saw that that little word own here carries a lot of weight in this passage. And what Peter is advocating is that the submission that a wife shows her husband be special and unique as compared to the submission that she would show to other men in the society. Remember in the Roman society uh, that this was written to, uh, women were always supposed to be uh, very deferential to the men. Uh, but they did that because they had to, because it was what society expected. But in the case of the home, the submission that she shows is to be a willing choice because this man, this husband, is different than every other man that she would come in contact with. Instead of being driven by society, it's actually driven by the choice that she makes because of her love for her husband. Now again, that's not saying that a husband and wife can't disagree. Again, that feedback mechanism is there or should be there for them to discuss things and come to something that makes sense uh, you know, for the whole household. Uh, but So now as we move forward, we see that Peter has particularly in mind in this passage, he's talking about wives with unbelieving husbands. Again, look at verse number 1. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, uh, you have to understand that in this time period, again, that would be a fairly common occurrence, and it's not necessarily a rare occurrence today. As sadly as that is, I can remember in the church where I grew up, there were several ladies who had unmarried or who had unsaved husbands. And they were always, you know, requesting prayer that God would save them and, and all of those kind of things. So it's not 
you know, it's, it's, it's not even rare in our society today. Now, we do know that the Bible says that we're not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever, according to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse 14. So, a Christian is not to knowingly marry an unbeliever, whether it's the, uh, whichever one of them is saved, whichever one of them is unsaved. But I believe that this was written more from the standpoint, because we're talking about the early church, we're talking about the growth of the church, we're talking about people getting saved sometimes in mass numbers. What we're talking about here is somebody who, when they got married, they were both lost. But now the wife has come to Christ. Now she has an unbelieving husband. What's she to do? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, we see some of the same kind of direction there about you know, how to live with an unbelieving spouse. But what Peter tells us in this passage is that a believing wife can have a tremendous impact on her husband's coming to Christ by the way that she conducts herself. Her personal testimony, her words, her actions can be used by the Holy Spirit to speak to his heart about the difference that Christ can make in a life and show him his need to acknowledge Christ as Savior. So again, that's one of the primary contexts that we see here. But we can't just leave it with a believing wife and an unbelieving husband. Why? Because the example that he gives here, just a few verses down, is the relationship between Sarah and Abraham, and both of them were believers. So even though in some of the context here, the primary context is a believing wife and an unbelieving husband, the truths that are taught here apply whether the husband is a believer or not. Okay, So it, it, it all connects together either way. So having said that, let's look at the next part of our passage where we see the command to be modest. Notice what it says in verse number 2. While they behold your chaste conversation. All right, that's the idea of being modest. As we've said in, in other studies, the word conversation, conversation here means more than just the things or the, that we say or the way that we say them. It actually means our conduct. It actually means our behavior, the way in which we live our lives. So that would include what we say and how we say it, but it also means everything about how we live our lives. Peter says that this manner of life, this conversation should be chaste. And in this, con in this context, the word actually just means to be modest and to be careful not to dirty your testimony by wrong associations or wrong attitudes. It means that as a wife, you have every intention of living a life that's pleasing to God and by extension, living a life that brings honor to the name of your husband. So that's what that little phrase there, chaste conversation, means. And, and that's the next thing that we see then is this, when they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, this is a lot of places where people get, you know, get kind of bent out of shape because they don't understand what this idea of fear is talking about here. The first question that we have to ask is, who or what should be feared? From the context, it doesn't make sense that the wife should be afraid of her husband. Like I said, although a lot of critics jump on that right there, and that's exactly what they try to say that it means. They see submission as some kind of subservience or slavery, and that fear ought to be the attitude that accompanies it. But as we've seen, the word submit doesn't mean to consider yourself a slave. And the idea of being afraid of your husband doesn't make sense because in verse 6, it says, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So this is not about being afraid of your husband. Instead, what it's talking about here is recognizing that God, regardless of what happens in your life as a married couple, God is still ultimately in control of the situation. Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I have been young and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And in Matthew chapter number 6 verses 31 through 33, it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall you eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? 
For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What this verse is saying is that as a wife, you should never forget that what you do and say as a wife has a tremendous impact on your husband and how others perceive him. If you, if you live your life trusting him because you trust God, then that gives the testimony it supports your husband, but it gives that testimony to the lost world that you do trust God for all that you have. So, uh, Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10, says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that she shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That chaste conversation coupled with fear simply means in this context that the husband doesn't worry about her going behind his back and trying to undermine what's going on. It says, her husband is known, this is verse 23 in Proverbs 31 as well, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. The wife, uh, the way that a wife conducts herself not only impacts her husband directly, but like I said, it impacts the way that others think and talk about her husband. What Peter is saying here is that your chaste conversation should be coupled with fear, that you should never forget that the way you conduct yourself impacts your husband, the perception that people have, and the way that your home actually functions. Then we see the next piece in verses 3 and 4, where we see the call to be discerning. Look at this. Whose adorning, talking about the ladies, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now again, we've talked about how these verses have been abused and wrongly applied. This is another one of those places where a lot of people have taken these verses and kind of misapplied it to things that it didn't need to actually be connected to. This verse is not saying that women shouldn't wear makeup. It's not saying that women shouldn't wear jewelry. It's not saying that they shouldn't be concerned with their clothing or their outward appearance. That's not what this is saying. What it's saying is, is that, it, again, it kind of goes back to the culture of the day specifically. In that day, the, the, the type of clothing that a woman wore, the type of hairstyle, the amount and the type of jewelry that they had were all a statement. It was a way to bring attention to herself and to her station in life as compared to others. Remember, she always kind of had to be, uh, you know, uh, kind of deferential to everybody. So the counter to that was, is you go out dressed just as much, you, you, you make sure if you have to be deferential, they're going to notice you anyway. That's kind of the attitude that we see here. And, and in some respects, let's be honest, it's not that much different today. For some people, it's all about the brand, the designer clothes, the designer pocketbook, the designer shoes, and even today, God help us, they have designer sunglasses. I mean, really? I mean, if you want to wear them, that's fine. I, you know, like I said, if, that's, you know, if it's done in the right context, it's fine. I don't get it. I mean, I, I'll just be particularly honest, just really honest with you. These things are often used today, just like they were used in, in, in the New Testament times. They were used as a statement about who the woman is, where they are, and, and, what, and where they're going. And what Peter is saying here is that for a Christian wife, that shouldn't be the focus. Isaiah 3.16 describes this kind of woman. It says, Moreover the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Okay? That's the description of Isaiah about the children of the women in Israel during that day. Now, if Isaiah had lived in East Tennessee, <laughs> he would have said that the daughters of Zion are trying to draw attention to themselves by pressing around. Literally. I'm not making this stuff up. 
The word prissy literally means to be over adorned. So when you talk about something, somebody prissing around, that's the idea. It's not saying here in this passage that a wife can't have and wear nice things or take the time to look nice. It's saying that those things, whether it's the jewelry, the makeup, the clothing, whatever it is, that those things are not to be the focus or the defining characteristic of who she is. Instead, there's to be a greater adornment, something that shows her worth much more than her clothing or her jewelry. And we see that in the next command where, we're, where we see to be humble and self-controlled. And again, that's in verse number four. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Now the word meek means to have a gentle spirit. And the word quiet carries the idea of a peaceful and quiet nature. Now, here's the thing that this passage tells us. A woman will draw attention to herself in one of two ways. The first way is by using the things of this world, the makeup, the, all those things, to, to speak for her. Now, truthfully, let's be honest. If a woman dresses in order to be noticed, and I'm not talking about, you know, a lot of times we use that phrase and we mean something totally different. I'm just talking about if somebody's dressing up just to be seen. Guess what? They're seen. I mean, let's just, I mean, cut to the chase. This is rubber meets the road Christianity here. If that happens, that's, they're going to get noticed. But just like fashion trends come and go, so will people's memory of that kind of woman. The second, though, is by living in such a way that it's obvious that there's more to her than just the things of this world. It's her attitude, as summarized here, and in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we see that it's not only through her attitude, but her actions as well. Listen to this. In like manner also that women should adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So it's about the attitude, and it's about the actions not the attire, okay? And the Bible says that if your concern is inner adornment, that the impression that you make will be lasting as opposed to temporary. And it will be noticed by your husband, it will be noticed by others, and most importantly, it will be noticed by God since it's precious in His sight. It tells us that specifically. And that brings us to the last command, where we see that a wife should be respectful. And we see that again in verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, have you ever studied the life of Abraham? And have you ever checked out, or the life of Sarah and Abraham, better way of saying it. Have you ever checked out the life of Sarah and Abraham in the book of Genesis and seen how many times she calls him Lord. Have you ever done that? Can I tell you what the answer is? In Scripture? One time. Only one time. Now, I'm not saying she didn't do it other times. But scripturally, we see only one time. And it's interesting that it happens in Genesis 18. Now let me tell you what happens here. Genesis 18 is where Christ and the two angels come to Abraham. Christ is talking to uh, Abraham and uh, Christ is talking to Abraham and he says, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a child of your own. Now remember, Abraham's close to 100 years old. Sarah's right behind him. She's 90 years old. And in chapter 18 of Genesis and verse number 12, it says this. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure 
my Lord being old also. Okay? That's the only time in Scripture that Sarah specifically calls him Lord. Now, let me read it again. Listen real closely. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. Now, here's the question. Who was Sarah talking to when she said that? She was talking to herself. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying. Now, did you catch that? Now, like I said, I'm not saying that she didn't call him Lord other times. I, you know, I, I think contextually she probably did. But the only time in Scripture that we see her specifically calling him Lord is when she's talking to herself. Now, this is what I want us to see tonight. Sarah's respect for Abraham was so deep and so sincere that it showed even when she was talking about him to nobody else but herself. She wasn't just doing it in front of other people. The one time in Scripture we see it, she's not talking to anybody except herself. She legitimately and honestly respected her husband. And you have to realize that she had this respect for him even after the debacle of Egypt, where Abraham had her lie about her being his sister which resulted in her being taken to the harem of Pharaoh. She respected him even if at times he didn't make the best decisions. And that's the critical point. If you want your marriage relationship to thrive and not just survive, especially when it seems like the world is coming down around you and the devil's fighting every which way that he can and everything else, as a wife, you have to come to the point that you respect your husband despite his shortcomings. He might be short-tempered. He might not be the best organizer. He might not be the best handyman. He, best, he might not be the best money manager. He may leave his socks on the floor. He may not even be able to make his own bologna sandwich. I don't know why that gets so many laughs. I'm wondering about some of you men. But because he's your husband, the head of your home, placed there by Christ, you have to learn to respect him. And that respect needs to be sincere, so sincere that it shows even when you're talking about him to nobody else but yourself. That genuine level of respect, I promise you, will not go unnoticed by your husband. And the truth is, just like we see here in this passage, it will spur him on to greater obedience to Christ and to better fulfill his role as the head of the home. And it will not go unnoticed by God. Who can, and God can make your husband, no matter his shortcomings, be a better husband and leader of the home. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Father, I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight. And while in many ways we could unpack a lot of different things and spend a lot of time on each of these little points, Father, this is just the direction that you led us for this night. I pray that it's a help. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will touch hearts, both husbands and wives. Because, Father, there is no doubt that Satan is a roaring lion, is stalking about seeking whom he can devour. 
And Father, one of the prime places he's attacking now is the home. He's attacking the foundation of the home, being the, uh, the, the relationship between one man and one, wife, one woman for life. He's attacking the very genders of our homes. And as those battles rage on, he's going to begin to attack Christian homes in particular because of the stands that they take. And so, Father, may the ladies take heed to what we see here. May the men take heed to what they see as we get into the next message in this series, looking at the husband. Not as a, just a source of knowledge, but as a way of living so that when Satan does attack, we can thrive and not just survive. We love you. We give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Don't forget this Wednesday night we will be probably, unless something happens I'm not expecting, we'll be wrapping up our look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and then like I said, Sunday uh, and Saturday and Sunday, we've got the creation conference, so just be much in prayer. Come out for that. I, I know it's going to be a blessing. Uh, like I said, some of you have heard Dr. Robert Carter speak on video, uh, I'm, and like I said, I met him several years ago, but I'm really looking forward to actually spending some time fellowshipping uh, and, and just getting to talk with him, and so I know it'll be a blessing, so please come out and be a part of that. Also, like I said, don't forget those of you that are via live stream, we will not be having our prayer time tonight. Uh, but because we've got a, a business meeting that we need to take care of a few things. Uh, and uh, so we will see you, Lord willing, on Wednesday evening. All right? All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. Again, for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you so much for the blessing that Rhema is as being not only to our children, but being to our church. What a blessing it was to have them up tonight. Father, I pray that you'd just bless them extraordinarily for their efforts, each, both the teachers and the children. And we'll give you the praise and glory for all that you do through us and in us and for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. My brother, you let me know when we're off. You are? Okay. <laughs>